You ever had something that's special to you, not only because you like it, but also because it reminds you of a specific time in your life? I'm sure we all have that one thing, whatever it is, whether it be an album, a photo, uh, a toaster. We all have that thing, or things, shout out to plurals, that kind of work like a time machine as soon as we see it, or listen to it, taste it, smell it, or even think about it. It transports us back to a specific time in our lives. A nostalgia machine, if you will. Patent pending. And I'm no different. I have a few things that do this to me, including the OVA I'm about to dedicate an ungodly amount of time speaking about. And that is the underappreciated masterpiece that is Robot Carnival. Gather your points and notepads, because it's time for history class. Please pay attention, all of this will be on the test. Robot Carnival is an anime anthology OVA made by APPP Stop Laughing Studios. It was released on July 21st, 1987. The OVA is made up of nine different short stories that all loosely follow a similar theme. That being, well, robots and I guess stuff like dystopia, the future and cool as hell character designs. Each of these shorts were directed by some of the most legendary and acclaimed anime directors of all time. Seriously, this thing is reeking of goats. <laughs> Don't believe me? Huh. Okay, check this out. Apologies in advance for my abysmal pronunciation of any names mentioned for the duration of this video. I grew up in a city with as much cultural diversity as an EDL rally. With that out of the way, here we go. Atsuko Fukushima. Before Robot Carnival, she worked as a key animator on the anime classic Gogo 13 and after this OVA, she'd go on to direct a segment on Neo Tokyo titled Labyrinth Labyrinthos and she was a key animator on Akira, Kiki's Delivery Service and another goat tier anthology, Memories. Katsuhiro Otomo He made Akira. Need I say any more? Didn't think so. Koji Morimoto before Carnival, he worked as a key animator on Gogo 13, Macross Do Remember Love, and Fist of the North Star. After Carnival, he'd work on Neo Tokyo, Akira, Animatrix, Kiki's Delivery Service, and the Macross Plus miniseries and movie. Hidetoshi Omori. Before Carnival, he worked as a key animator on Mobile Suit Gundam 1, various Lupin shows, and Zeta Gundam. After Carnival, he worked on Bubblegum Crisis, the 1993 DBZ game, Final Freaking Fantasy 7, and Killer Kill. Yasu Omi Umetsu. Before Carnival, he worked as a key animator on Barefoot Gen and Zeta Gundam. After Carnival, he worked on Grave of the I'm Crying Profusely Fireflies, Akira, and Welcome to the NHK. Hiroyuki Kitazume. Before Carnival, he worked as a key animator on Zeta Gundam and Gundam ZZ or ZZ, uh, whichever side of the coin you're on. After Carnival, he'd work on Bubblegum Crisis and the DBZ Lord Slug movie, Mao Lamdo. Before Carnival, he was a key animator on Gogo 13 and Barefoot Gen. After Carnival, he'd work on Neo Tokyo and Metropolis, Hiroyuki Kitakubo. Before Carnival, he'd work on Yurisei Yatsura and Macross Do You Remember Love. After Carnival, he'd work on Akira, Gundam Chars, Chars? Uh, oh, I'm not googling that. Chars? C-H-A-R-S. I assume it's Chars. Oh boy, I hope the Gundam fans don't come and kill me. And he also worked on the 2015 Lupin Italian Adventure series. And last, but certainly not least, Takashi Nakamura. Before Carnival, he'd work on Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind and Macross Do You Remember Love. After Carnival, he'd work on Neo Tokyo, Akira and various Lupin projects. See what I mean? It's a sea of goats. And, since I'm feeling nice, I'll even tell you who did the music for this bad boy. This guy! This beautiful man is Joe Hisaishi, who is most known for composing the scores to Hayao Miyazaki's Studio Ghibli movies. You know, those unknown masterpieces such as My Neighbor Totoro, Princess Mononoke, and Spirited Away. You know, those movies that nobody talks about ever. Something a little light. But it wasn't just him. He had help from the likes of Isaku Fujita and Masahisa Takechi. Isaku Fujita is a complete mystery. I couldn't find squat on this dude. 
Masahisa Takechi, on the other hand, composed Beast King Go Lion, and, according to Wikipedia, Beast King was edited and trimmed to create an American version of the show called Voltron Defender of the Universe, which included new names and dialogue. He also composed an obscure French-Japanese anime named Once Upon a Time in Space, and the fact that this even exists is extraordinary. But that's a video for another day, made by somebody else. The OVA was released on VHS and Laserdisc on July 21st, 1987, Year of Our Lord, by JVC, but underperformed. Despite poor sales in Japan, the anthology was released in North American theatres and on video in 1991 by Streamline Pictures. Here, it once again underperformed. However, the film was commonly rerun in the 90s on the Sci-Fi Channel and later on the Turner Network, often paired with other feature-length anime films such as Vampire Hunter D, Demon City Shinjuku and Twilight of the Cockroaches, which helped it gain a cult following. So much so that a limited edition version was released in Japan in the year 2000 by Beam Entertainment. This limited edition would then be released in the US in 2015 by Discotech Media, who would also release a Blu-ray version in 2018 and a 4K Blu-ray version in 2021, which looks GORGEOUS, by the way. I couldn't find any info on the release schedule for the UK, but we can order it on Amazon, which is a dub. Many in the anime industry refer to the 80s as the golden age of anime, and this film is a shining example of why. Robot Carnival reportedly had a huge budget, but I couldn't find any proof to confirm this. But considering the names of the people involved, it wouldn't surprise me. The 20-something year old directors reportedly had complete creative freedom, which is a very rare luxury in the industry, even to this day. The maths is actually quite simple. Healthy economy equals weirder and more experimental anime. I don't see you taking notes. The OVA was supposedly mostly animated on ones, or full 24 frames per second, but I can't find any calls to confirm. Animating on ones means that for each second of animation, there are 24 new drawings, or frames. The reason I'm a bit skeptical in believing this is because for years people said Akira was animated in 24 frames per second, but that actually wasn't true at all. If you want to see a detailed explanation of why, please check out this video. And as for the dub, we don't talk about the dub. No, no, we don't speak on that. But for real though, it's fine. It's okay. Especially when they put back the stuff that they cut and, you know, released it normally. Then, yeah, it's okay. It's fine. Grab your passports, cameras, and oversized luggage full of clothes you will not wear because we're going on a trip down memory lane. Apologies if this goes on to sound like a bit of a tangent. I just need you guys to fully understand where I was mentally at the time of watching this. Plus, it'll give us a chance to get to know each other. Hi, I'm Nova. I like long walks on the beach, poetry about flowers, and Oli Mers ah! games. But no, seriously, I'll keep this short as possible. So, Sparknotes version is... I watched Robot Carnival in my second year of university. My first year of university was, to put it frank, uh, hell. Pretty damn awful. I didn't really know how to take care of myself, so my dorm room was pretty much always a mess. I couldn't really make friends either. I realised how shy and introverted I actually was and how I actually didn't have the people skills I thought I had. My diet at the time was awful. Like, straight garbage. Microwave meals every day, packs of chocolates, chips and sweets every night for dessert. I was abusing that student loan money. So, obviously, because of this horrendous diet, I gained a lot of weight, which affected my self-esteem. I legitimately think I was trying to eat myself to death. So yeah, I was lonely, I was insecure because of my weight, I didn't really know how to take care of myself, didn't know how to make new friends, and a girlfriend? HA! Forget about it. So, because of all this, I became very reliant on a certain plant-like substance that I will not mention the name, just in case my ops are watching and want to tell my parents. But uh, seriously though, um, I was a uh, full-on addict, and it uh, messed me up psychologically. Long story short, um, because of a bad field trip, I lost touch with reality for a uh, good year. Nothing felt real anymore. I struggled to connect with anything really, which led me down a deep spiral of depression. Things got so bad that I had to see a therapist, which wasn't that great because I don't think the person took me very seriously, which was a bit disheartening. So I was like, screw it. Let me try to find some joy in life again. So, what do I enjoy? What will make me feel better? And a couple things came to mind. 
writing, drawing, and watching anime, which is what I did. I would write, draw, and even make music in my spare time, which helped my state of mind quite a bit. Things would actually feel real again when I'd be making art. Art gave me a sense of purpose, as well as a sense of fulfillment and meaning, which is something I desperately needed at the time. Also, during this tumultuous period of my life, I watched some of my favourite animes of all time. Hunter x Hunter, FMA Brotherhood, Berserk 1997, Cowboy Bebop, Evangelion, Mushishi, and I continued One Piece. So, anime-wise, I, I, I was spoiled. Fast forward to second year. I'm now living with an old friend of mine from high school and my personal plan was to learn from my mistakes of last year and try not to spiral the way I did before. This was easier said than done though. I did improve my diet and I began doing light exercises so I didn't balloon again. And I did improve my social skills. But I don't think I tried as hard as I could have. Plus I was still battling with a few demons from last year. My depersonalization was still bugging me and I was still doing a course I disliked which was becoming more demanding. I tried to counteract my dark thoughts of meditation and sticking up positive mantras on my wall, which helped a little but I would still struggle. I even had bouts of insomnia during this time, as well as delightful nightmares from time to time, which as you could guess didn't help the sleep situation at all. Eventually I gave up on trying to make new friends and focused on making music, which was unsurprisingly quite dark. At this time I was pretty attracted to dark and weird art but most of all, I wanted to find artistic expressions that would inspire me to create. I wanted to be inspired, I wanted to watch things that were made with passion and had a voice and would tell a story in an interesting and unique way. Which is how I ended up discovering Angel's Egg. Which is an anime I could have easily dedicated an entire video to instead of Robot Carnival but Robot Carnival is more niche so… But who knows? We may need to talk about Angel's Egg at some point because that's another cool and unique piece of art that has stuck with me and inspired me as a creative in a few ways, but that's for another video. But anyway, I was looking for dark and weird things to watch. It didn't need to be anime, in fact around this time I watched those creepy YouTube shows, Don't Hug Me I'm Scared and Salad Fingers, great pieces of art but really creepy. I'll be honest, I have no idea how and why I watched Robot Carnival. I think maybe I watched Angel's Egg first and I wanted to watch something just as obscure and weird. I wanted something on the same vibe as that and that somehow led me to Robot Carnival even though they're pretty damn different. So basically what I'm trying to say is I don't know how I discovered it and why I watched it exactly especially since the reviews are okay but not that great. But boy oh boy am I glad that I ignored those lukewarm reviews and watched it anyway cause this shit right here is special. The first short is titled Opening and it was directed by Katsuhiro Otomo. It starts with a boy at a well who gets a piece of paper blown onto his leg. After reading the paper, he runs in a panic to his village. They speak a weird gibberish language that we can't understand. Well, unless you speak gibberish. But you can tell by his panicked facial expressions and frantic state that he didn't exactly read something particularly pleasant. The short then takes a suspenseful turn pretty quickly as the villagers see something large and ominous appear from the distance. At first it's not clear what this structure is but it's soon revealed to be a massive moving robot carnival machine. And wow is this thing detailed and batshit insane. This thing has a mechanical band, robots playing trumpets disguised as rocket launchers, fireworks are shooting all over the place and there's even dancing robots that explode in your face. <laughs> this would be lit as hell in person, you know, if you took away all the deadly weapons. So unfortunately for the gibberish speaking villagers, the giant party machine wipes out their entire village in mere moments. Tragic yet strangely beautiful. But for real, the amount of detail especially on the structure is incredible. This was a good opening for the OVA, it's short, loud, cool to look at and violent. It kind of gives you a good teaser taste of what's in store. Shout out to Ultimo. 
The MVP of this short has to be the giant carnival machine. Even though it did just wipe out an entire village of innocent people and children. But then again, how do we really know they were innocent? They could be cannibals for all we know. They could be eating their own children for all we know. They weren't listening to that boy. They were just plotting on what kind of barbecue sauce they were going to marinate this loud ass kid with. I'm not saying that's what's happening exactly. But I also haven't seen anything that proves otherwise, so... The second short of the OVA is titled Frankengears and was directed by Koji Morimoto. And this short follows a mad scientist who's trying to build his own Frankenstein's monster, but with a robot twist. Of course, this is Robot Carnival after all. The first thing that really pops out to me about this short is its really cool, dark and moody aesthetic. It really does fit the vibe of the story Koji is trying to tell, and this is enhanced by the SICK dark techno soundtrack slapping in the background. As the kids would say, it's a vibe. As the scientist tries to seemingly provide the robot with enough power, something goes wrong and the electricity stops. Same thing happens to me when I <clears throat> forget to pay my electricity bill. He tries to solve the issue, but to no success. Story of my life. Just when all seems lost, the film turns into a really cool and trippy black and white. before then going back to normal. Suddenly, the robot comes to life in a dramatic and chaotic sequence. The scientist seemingly doesn't care that his whole life's work and place of business is getting completely wrecked before his eyes. He's just happy the robot is alive. It doesn't take long for the robot to realise it's alive. Soon after the robot's birth, it kills the scientist slash his creator. I'm not 100% sure as to why it killed the scientist. Maybe the robot realised what it was and the disturbing ramifications of its creation and couldn't handle it? So it resented its creator for bringing it to life. <sighs> Story of my life. I'm joking! Or maybe the scientist just created something that was ultimately destined to create destruction. Even if that wasn't the scientist's goal. I've always liked the shot of the robot looking at his hand after becoming sentient, then following this with the death of the scientist. I think this key shot is what allows the short to birth the many ways of interpreting it. What do you guys think? Why did the robot yeet his daddy? Also, I haven't read the original Frankenstein book, so let me know if there are any other connections to this short that I may not have noticed. The third short is titled Deprive and was directed by Hitotoshi Omori. It opens with an explosion, because explosions are cool. A gentleman walks like a badass from the explosion and we're going to assume his hearing is completely intact despite this. The short then cuts to a futuristic city before then showing us a ship crash landing. Just a note, I really like the look of this short. It's defo got a Macross look to it and since I'm a Macross fan, I find it very visually pleasing. This planet seems to be a place where certain types of robots and humans can harmoniously exist. <laughs> I know what that feels like. But the happy times don't last for long, cue the robot invasion. A little girl is then kidnapped from her robot companion. The short then cuts back to the guy from the start of the film. He beats up a bunch of robots with ease, successfully keeping up the badass persona. I would also like to mention that a mix of synth pop and new wave music is playing in the background and it is wonderful. Also, also, I would like to once again commend the world and robot design. This look good. Very uh, dystopian. The colours, COLORS, are great too. The short is popping with them colours. So, badass guy loses to a bunch of robots and gets captured in the same fortress as where the little girl is being kept. The badass guy got caught by one of the most 80s looking anime villains I've ever seen. Look at this guy, and he's pulling it off too. I know who I'm going as for next Halloween. After being tortured and not in a good way, we realise that the badass guy has been a robot all along. The same robot that was with the little girl. And if you rewind back to the start of the film, it actually shows you this beforehand but I didn't notice. I was probably checking my phone to make sure I still had zero notifications from anybody. So uh, yeah. 
Anyway, long story short, Robot Badass Dude has got hands and beats the crap out of the bad robots and Mr. 80s villain. And yeah, I don't really have anything more to add except it's good fun, it's colourful and the music slaps. I love me some simps. Simps? Wait, what? <laughs> synths. Synths. I love me some synths. Yeah. He saved the girl, by the way. The next short is named Presence and was directed by Yasuomi Yumetsu. It starts off with a robot bloke getting his head stolen by some snot-nosed kids. Don't you just hate when that happens? We then cut to a family eating dinner. The father slash husband compliments his wife on the soup, cause good soup is hard to find these days. The story follows the husband who admits to being envious of his hard working career driven wife. He refers to her as dynamic and assertive. Hmm. The music in this short is so soothing, yet it's also kind of haunting as well. I really like the world of this short too. It's got a slight steampunk feel and it also seems like it's based or inspired by old European town architecture, which is cool and works well as a setting for the story. But once again, something about this world feels kind of haunting and creepy and I can't put my finger on exactly why. Maybe you guys can let me know. So fast forward and we find out that Mr. Superlover has a secret hidden in the woods. This guy here has been hiding a robot doll in an abandoned cabin. I for one identify heavily with this. I too also do my best to keep my life size dolls a secret. But probably for different reasons to this gentleman. <laughs> anyway, his family don't know about this doll. As he works on the robot doll, he explains that he sought out femininity in his wife because he never knew a mother's love. The robot comes to life and we get to know her a bit. Soup Lover names her Meow, I guess. I think it was a joke but I don't really get it, but it's a sweet moment. Meow says she wishes to fall in love. This catches the Soup Man off guard cause she wasn't programmed to say or feel such emotions. Meow exposes Soup Man's loneliness. She explains how he's still a little boy inside. This point is made more evident by the shot of his desk filled with children's toys. Like most of us, Meow questions what her purpose is. She craves human intimacy. Her creator once again questions how robots can conjure up such emotions. Once again, just like most of us, she just wants to live a normal life, experience normal human things and live of her own free will. She knows herself and she knows what she wants. Superman harms Meow after she seemingly tries to connect with him. Throughout their interaction, he's denied feeling loneliness or unhappiness. Every time the doll speaks of human emotions, he brushes it off and is dismissive of the robot's ability to feel such things. This all seems like a defensive mechanism for the man. He's in denial. He's living a life that doesn't truly fulfill him, despite on its surface seeming like he has the ideal family life. We see him raise a weapon and it's clear he's contemplating destroying the doll. We then fade out before seeing if he goes through with it. Fast forward to him as an old man. As he sits on the porch, the man sees a vision of his creation. She's been waiting for her prince, the prince being him, but he never came back to her. She suddenly breaks before his eyes. He then, after years we can presume, returns to the cabin, 
and sees his creation broken and unresponsive. He abandoned her. Filled with regret, he may now be questioning if it was the right thing to do to hide and destroy something that was capable of conjuring up human emotions, human wants, needs, desires. He said it himself that he craved femininity and a love similar to one that a mother could provide, something he could not get home from his own wife. So in his loneliness and maybe depression, he consciously or unconsciously built the thing that he'd been longing for. Now a question could be asked if the robot did feel genuine love for him or did he just build her that way. Early in the short, he does say that he did not program her to say or feel such emotions but how can we know that for sure considering everything he said about himself? Maybe he really didn't know what he was creating, he was just creating from emotion. He was manifesting what he longed for. But it's clear that over the years he never did truly find the love that he was looking for. At the end of the short, he's back on the porch and his wife calls for him to come back inside the house but instead of going back to his wife, he leaves with the robot or the vision of the robot. This could symbolise that he's passed on to the next life and maybe the fact that the robot doll came to get him could mean that his version of heaven will be with his creation. Once again, there are many ways this entire short could be interpreted so please share your thoughts in the comment section. I could be completely wrong with my take. This is my favourite short for sure. Oh wow, what a, what a, what a sentence, short for sure? That, that doesn't even, that doesn't even sound right. This is my favourite short for sure, yeah. This short is filled with such mystery, eeriness, sadness, beauty and room for interpretation that it almost begs for repeat viewings. I can never really describe what this short makes me feel like after watching it. It's like a weird mix of feeling unsettled, yet also strangely calm. It's weird. Anyway, great short. The next short is titled Starlight Angel and was directed by Hiroyuki Kitazumi. This short follows two girls at the world's funnest looking amusement park. The brunette of the two catches the eye of a thirsty robot. Hey, even robots need to get their gears greased every once in a while. <laughs> hey! The brunette drops her necklace and the robot picks it up. The blonde girl then meets up with her boyfriend. The brunette realises that the blonde girl's boyfriend looks familiar and through flashback it's discovered that the brunette and the blonde's boyfriend used to be an item. And if that wasn't enough tea, it's revealed that he was the one who gave the brunette the necklace. How scandalous! The brunette runs away crying. And I thought I was the only one who could make girls run away crying without saying a single word. We then cut back to the thirst bot from before and instead of seeing how much you could sell the brunette's necklace for at the local pawn shop, he instead tries to find the brunette and return the necklace. A pawn shop's even a thing in the UK? Pawn? Pawn? See I'm, see, I'm, see, I'm trying to not say pawn, wait pawn, pawn, pawn shop, pawn, 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 whatever! Fast forward to the brunette on a roller coaster and on said roller coaster she's teleported above the park and seems to be falling to her untimely demise until she's saved by the robot who then teaches her how to fly. Don't you just love it when that happens? Thirstbot then tries to return the necklace to the brunette but she rejects it. They then get attacked by a giant regular killer robot. Hmm, <laughs> that's an interesting marketing gimmick. Come to our park, there's rides, food and also you might get violently killed by Decepticon. In the battle for their lives, it's revealed the robot is just some dude in a suit. To my recollection, if you rewind back, uh, you can actually see him take off the helmet and put it back on whilst he was running, something something like that. I I, I can't be can't be asked to rewind it right now, but I think they kind of already hint to him being human. But um yeah, so I thought I should mention that just in case people thought I wasn't paying attention. I was paying attention! Leave me alone! I was paying attention, I promise. I wasn't looking at my phone to zero notifications again. Anyway, the guy smiles, clearly confident in his good looks, but the brunette pushes him away. Troika brought a kick to the ego. Also, let's once again talk about the music. When the music gets happy, it makes me feel strangely nostalgic. It's like the music I'd hear in those old Yu-Gi-Oh! Tag Force games I'd play as a kid. I can't remember if the songs in those games sound anything like this short but that's where my mind's going so I'll stick with it. 
In the end, the first bot kills the final boss with a freaking lightsaber, and he and the brunette end up together. This was a much more fun and light-hearted short compared to the last one we saw, which I think was a smart move. I think having two heavy shorts back to back would have given this anthology a much more morbid feel than they probably intended. It's fun and simple. Fun for the whole family. The next short is titled Cloud and was directed by Mao Lamdo. The short follows a robot walking through a strange land filled with various images above its head being formed in the clouds. The short has a really cool and unique sketch look that really makes it stand out from the other shorts. I would say style wise it's the most different looking and experimental of all of the shorts. Gosh I'm saying shorts a lot. Shorts, shorts, shorts. Sounding weird to me now. The music is once again great. It goes from being jolly in the beginning to then being large and epic to finally being calm and just plain old whimsical. In the clouds we see waves, giant jellyfish, aliens, a shirtless dude, babies and even a crying angel. Eventually a storm breaks out. Maybe the angel's tears caused the storm? Or maybe the angel was crying because the storm was coming? I don't know. So yeah, the storm breaks out and through the chaos an explosion occurs, a rocket ship takes flight, lightning strikes and life as we know it maybe ends? Uh, a lot happens. Bunnies pop up at some point. I think trying to decipher exactly what's going on would be headache inducing and ultimately futile. Like some of the other shorts, I think Cloud leaves a lot of room for interpretation. So please do check it out yourselves and see what theories you come up with. But my god, is it beautiful. And a little haunting. Especially the ending with the choice of song. That song always puts me in my feels. For whatever reason. I even sampled it on a mixtape I made um, during second year. So yeah, we're bringing that back. So the music that I told you I was making before in my second year of university, I actually ended up releasing it. It didn't do that well. Um, I didn't uh, market it very much. Um, the mix was kind of bad because I couldn't afford to get it mixed and, and mastered and it's pretty damn dark. But you know, it had some. He had it had this sample on one of the songs. Uh, so yeah. So and, and you know, I didn't delete it because um, you know I. Sometimes you 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 gotta show your failures. You got you got you got you gotta show your failures. You can't uh, just uh, uh, hide from them. You know. I think the 
the ideas I had for that project were interesting and cool. And I do like some of the instrumentals and some of the subject matter. And, you know, the concept was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I think I could, it could have done, it could have, you know, it needed a bit more work. Let's just say that it needed a, uh, a, a bit more work and I probably should have collaborated with, a, you know, some people who actually had bare experience of, you know, making music than I did, but yeah. So yeah, that, the, I, I, I did manage to find the sample. I think it took me ages. I think if I tried to find the sample again for that ending song, it would, uh, <laughs> take me ages because i think it took me ages before and luckily i didn't get taken down for copyright so yeah so yeah that's just how much i connected with this song at the time that song is just uh, i don't know it's it's it speaks to me it speaks it speaks to me so yeah really good song uh you should check it out i don't know if i'm actually gonna include any of the songs in this um in this video because we we might get obliter obli obliterated by copyright so i don't know um we may not stand a chance of copyright in general but yeah so i don't know but if i don't show it or play a sample of it just yeah just ch just check this out just check out robert convoy in, in general it's a, it's a it's a good time anyway like presence this is another short that taps into an emotion that i can't really explain it's not sadness it's not happiness it's not fear it's not nostalgia it's some weird mix that i can't put my finger on it all just hits at once to offer you a wholly unique experience i know i know i said presence is my favorite but cloud is really giving it a real run for its money because even to this day to this day to this day to this day i haven't quite seen anything quite like cloud Maybe that's because it would be extremely difficult to replicate the style, music, journey, and raw emotion this animation produces in such a short time frame. And if that is the case, then what does that say about the achievement of the short? The next short is called Strange Tales of Meiji Machine Culture, Westerners Invasion because short titles are for sissies apparently. The short is about a crazy foreigner who comes through with a giant robot that kind of looks like a giant banana and terrorises a small village. We soon find out that a kid and his friends from the village have their own giant robot and come through Power Ranger style. Their robot really does have an interesting and unique design. It's mostly made out of wood and seems to be steam powered. I really like it. Bruv, imagine having your own giant robot and defending your town with the homies. That's every kid's dream, right? The villain is named John and I assume he's supposed to be an American because he speaks in what I think is supposed to be an American accent in the sub. A machine invented by me? The world's greatest brain! Get out of the bay! Alright, I'll show you! But the guy voicing him seems to be Japanese, which means the accent unfortunately sounds like, uh, well, a Japanese dude trying to sound like an American. But I've heard worse, I suppose. Bro, imagine like, it's not a Japanese dude and it's actually just an American dude. And I've just assumed that this dude sounds like a Japanese dude trying to sound American, even though he is American. That would be so awkward. I'm sorry if that's true. I love this, I love this OVA. Please don't hurt me. The Japanese American dude puts up a good fight and it doesn't help that the kid leader and the girl start arguing in the middle of battle. There's a time and place for this children. But anyway, the plot is pretty predictable and I'm pretty sure most of you can tell how this is going to end. But as I was watching this, I kinda wish this was a real series. 
I could have easily seen this being adapted into a 24 episode series back in the day, or maybe even a full length movie. Even though we weren't with the characters for very long, they did make an impression and I could easily see myself getting attached to these characters if we had more time with them. So yeah, in the end, the foreigner loses and bikes to safety. Uh, about what you'd expect, but still a fun short nonetheless. You took an L on this one, Merkins. This short is titled Chicken Man and Redneck. Sounds like something they would have shown on the Bravo network back in the day. And it was directed by Takashi Nakamura. This is a wild one. Basically, a giant red robot arrives and pretty much messes up the entire city. In the midst of the destruction, a red hooded robot proceeds to turn scad parts and electrical wiring into sentient robots, thus creating himself quite the army. A man awakes in the midst of the chaos and sees how messed up things have gotten and tries to escape. Little Red Robot Hood spots him and chases him down like a dog. One thing off the bat that I want to say is, this short at times can really make you feel unsettled. It can really be a little spooky and creepy. Or maybe that's just me and nobody else finds this really creepy or spooky and you know I need to like man up and, and stuff. But uh, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm, I'm a man. I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got hair on my chest, bro. I, I've got hair. I'll, I'll, I'll fight anybody. I'll fight you. I'll fight you. Who are you? What's your name? Come on. <clears throat> anyway, 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 um, okay, what was that? Okay, cool. I think it's the level of detail and the art direction of the apocalyptic setting that really draws you in and really, like, immerses you in the chaos and bleakness of it all. So anyway, the man starts to cause more problems than the red-hooded robot would like, thus causing the bot to rage out a bit. Kind of like me after playing Elden Ring for more than 15 minutes. Soon after Red Hood's hissy fit, things start to collapse spectacularly for the robot Armada leading to their eventual destruction. The man miraculously lives and ends up on the top of a skyscraper. I don't really have much to say about this one, the only word that really comes to mind is spectacle, and to be honest, a bit of awe. As I said, the destruction is immensely detailed and that is the real star of the show here. The short really does feel like a flex by Takashi, just so he can show you how large and epic he can make a set piece, whilst also providing said set piece with a sense of atmosphere and momentum. It's very clear to see why he, in particular, was chosen to work on Akira. The Akira vibes are very evident in this short, and I love it. The final short, conveniently titled Ending, was directed by Otomo again. Hey! The short is pretty much a roll credits sequence. It's mostly just pictures of the amazing illustration from the OVA, as well as the giant robot carnivore machine's destruction, which is cool to see. It does, however, have a post-credit scene. Eh, eh, sort of. 
Yeah, before the Marvel Cinematic Universe was even a thing. Crazy, right? At first, it seems like a sweet send-off scene. A family of the gibberish-speaking people have gathered around the dinner table, admiring their father's discovery, a small robot he found in the desert. All seems nice and wholesome until it, um, uh, blows up. I presume killing them all in an instance. Very wholesome indeed. And yeah, that's Robot Carnival. The reason I have such a connection and appreciation for this OVA slash film is not only because there was clearly a lot of love and time and care put into making it, from the striking animation to the various and unique designs of the different worlds and characters in each film, to the beautiful scores that help take each of the shorts to another level. It's all of these things, but it's also the time in my life when I watched it. As I explained before, I watched this at a pretty rough time in my life and I was in a space where I was seeking inspiration, I was seeking something different, something cool, something special, and that's what Robot Carnival is for me. Is it perfect? Uh, not quite. I love it, but even I'll admit it has its flaws, like most things. And if you really wanted to, somebody could make a whole other video nitpicking all of its faults, but I choose not to highlight those things because this video is about appreciation and acknowledging what it did right and why it deserves your attention, especially if you're a fan of this old school type of animation. There are definitely elements of Robot Carnival that I plan to implement or already have implemented into my own creative work. What did I implement exactly? Ha! <laughs> nice try. I ain't stitching on myself, fam. I ain't getting sued that easily, Inspector. Also, another thing I love about this OVA is, bro, it's just a lot of fun. It's fun. It doesn't take itself too seriously and it can be a bit silly at times. I didn't realize on my first time of watching this how much I was in need of watching something fun. I was so fixated on watching dark and experimental things that I neglected the fact that I was in need of something more chill, I guess. And you know, don't get me wrong. like. Some elements of Robot Carnivore can be pretty dark and, you know, I've referred to a bunch of scenes in this anthology as, you know, haunting and creepy. So, yeah, it definitely does have those, you know, creepy, dark elements and experimental elements as well. But, you know, overall, I would still, I still think, you know, compared to like other things, it's pretty, pretty tame to me. And look, I love dark and serious as much as the next guy. Monster is probably in my top 2 animes of all time. It's a 10 bro. Do not argue with me on this. I own a very sharp pair of scissors. Anyway, I love that anime can give us a monster, but also give us a robot carnival. Which, fun fact, I watched both of these around the same time. So, I was eating bruv. Anime has so many hidden gems that may not receive the best of reviews. I myself have been guilty of not giving shows or movies a chance based on reviews. It's got less than 7 out of 10? Unworthy. But like, you really don't know what you may love that others might find, and I hate this word, mid. Yeah, it's easy to watch an 8 or a 9 out of 10 series, but be a daredevil every once in a while and flirt and tickle with a 6 every now and again. They may not always be gems, but when you find that special one, the one that clicks, the one that truly connects with you, despite its flaws, despite it not being talked about, despite it going under the radar, that's when you finally, finally have mastered the heart of the cards. Okay, I admit it, I did not know how to finish that sentence, but you know what I mean. Go out, find your gem, and then send me a message on Instagram so I can add it to my watch list that is now so long that by the time I watch every anime on that list, I'll be old, grey, and going up that shiny escalator that Tom was going up in in that one Tom and Jerry episode. You know the one. And even then, One Piece still probably won't be finished. That was a long one. That was a long one. What on earth was I thinking? I must have lost my mind. I must have lost my mind. Why did I do that? That was a lot of writing. That was a lot of talking. I don't even like to speak. 
yeah, I decided to narrate this whole thing. What? What? Why? Why? Why would I do that? Why? Was it? Oh, whatever. It's done. It is finished. It is complete. It. It, it, it is you no know, made. So yeah, that's the video slash essay slash documentary slash rambling session. I. I. I really do hope you enjoyed it. I really. Yeah, because if you didn't didn't enjoy it, I um. Um, so I'll, I'll just break down and cry, cry, cry for sure. Um, so, but yeah, seriously, yeah. Th uh, thank you for watching this. If you watched it all the way, all the way through, and um, yeah, it's much appreciated. And um, yeah, this, yeah, this has been a journey to make this. Yeah, I um, this took up so much time that my girl left me. Um, my job gave me the boot because I never showed up anymore. Uh, my family cut ties with me because I refused to shower, and my pet turtle died. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Psych! <laughs> Never had a pet turtle. <laughs> but no, uh, for real, um, thank you for watching. It, it really is uh, appreciated, and um, if you could possibly um, give this video a like, and also uh, give it a cheeky subscribe, that would be much appreciated, because um, that's what uh, YouTubers uh, say, um, because of um, the algorithm and, 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 and stuff, so people can see this and, um, and um, criticize my accent and stuff. Um, but yeah, if you if you did like it, um, a like would be nice and a subscribe, even though I don't know if I'm ever, if we're ever going to make anything like this ever again. But um, we'll see how this one does. Um, I guess if, if people like it, um, I can get some other sucker to do it because this nearly killed me and um, destroyed my life. <laughs> no, I need to stop joking. No, but this was actually fun. It was fun. It was fun to make. It was interesting. I'm, I, I'm glad they let me revisit um, Robot Carnivore. It really brought back a lot of memories and um, it really allowed me to be uh, more open than I thought I'd ever be on a, on a, on a YouTube video. Um, I was, uh, for years I've been watching people do this, but I never thought I would actually do it. So now I'm actually doing it. It's, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's ugh, vulnerable. Ugh, feelings. Ugh, ugh, ugh. But yeah thank you i yeah I, I appreciate it and um uh please enjoy this uh whilst it lasts before it gets taken down for um yeah copyright infringement um so um until then um yeah please check out robot carnival and if you do watch it uh, feel free to send me leave a comment about how what you thought or send me or send uh the studio Tumblr page a message on instagram and Either way, I'll see it, and uh, yeah, we can yeah just talk about uh, your interpretation, your theories, and 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 if you've already seen Robot Carnival before, you know you can talk about you know just let us know what you thought. Um, when where were you when you first watched it? Did you own the Blu-ray? Did you watch it back in the day? Did you watch it recently? Just uh, yeah, let us know. We uh, we love to uh, we love to talk about this stuff because um, we don't want to do anything else, and yeah, so. Yeah, once again, thank you. Um, I won't hold you up any longer because it's probably already going to be very long. So, yeah, thank you. Bye bye. We're supposed to say it as short, though. Well, what's the difference? <laughs>